lesson of today. Um, the first lesson of today will be scripts. So yes. going from the uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, more into a command line um, area and kind of the very, very first step to make code really reusable without modifying the code itself. Yeah, and that's related to this first icebreaker or second icebreaker question here. How do you run the same thing over and over but with slightly different parameters? like the same code with different data. Yeah. So, hmm. and, and should I share my screen and we can get straight to the lesson? Yep. Sounds okay. like a plan. I will push a button here and it transfers. I'll adjust that. Okay, so as a reminder for the schedule coming to scripts here, I open this. So what does the word script even mean? <laughs> yeah. To me, script means a kind of self-contained small, very small program that doesn't have a lot of interactions uh, yet, but that's just some very small thing. It can call additional libraries, but in itself, it doesn't um, provide a, a lot yeah. of a, it doesn't provide a lot of code. Um, that's what I think of when I'm talking about a script. Um, when it gets more complex, I would talk, rather talk about a program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is this lesson really about scripts or programs? Or hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> I is think both. Like, yeah, uh, I guess. How, it, how it's about the transition from different uh, from different um, systems of using uh, of using code. Yes. Okay. And yes, exactly. So it, the point is, this lesson. So so far we've been showing things in Jupyter. So basically, you can click and run things in whatever order you run. So now that we have scripts here, we'll be able to. Uh, like plug our code into other things a little bit better. Yeah. And oh, at, at least at, at least we, we we will be able to um rerun our code. Yeah, with, with different different parameter sets, mm -hmm. um without actually modifying the code. Because if you're modifying a Python script or the the Jupyter notebook by editing your initial conditions or your variables or the source files or whatever, you're always modifying the code. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so up here, there's the section on why scripts. So if you had to convince the people listening here that you should consider making a script or a program out of your code. Um, well, the the, the main the main reason I would say is it, um it very often comes down to um I have a certain uh cer certain pipeline that I've developed for one example, and now uh people want they want to use this pipeline for multiple for multiple different data sets. Um, of course, if I have that in a in the Jupyter notebook, I can every time. Yeah change the new Jupyter notebook, change the input variables and run it for their data set. Um, but it would but that needs uh, me to do it again and again and again and I will likely do typos and whatnot in there. Um, yeah so I'd rather have some kind of folder where I have the data sets and I want to go through all the files in that folder. Mm -hmm. Um Okay. And we potentially go... I want to run this on a cluster or something. Yeah, that's a good way to say. Like some people come and want to use our cluster to run tens, like they have hundreds of input data sets and say, I have this Jupyter notebook. How do I run it on a hundred different things in parallel? That's sort of hard. But if you make a script out of it, then we can make a it's thing that's extremely easy to. Script. Just and, run it with a hundred different input parameters. Yeah, and that's where yeah okay. scripts or the transition to Python scripts from a Python notebook comes yeah. in. So we have two exercises prepared for today. Um, the first one is coming up shortly, 
So it's just about converting a Python notebook yeah. or a Jupyter notebook to a yes. Python script. Yeah. I guess here's our short-term roadmap. So I will do a demonstration of converting a notebook to a Python script. And then you'll have five minutes to try this yourself. Then we'll come back, talk, demonstrate more, and then there'll be a much longer exercise where you can finish up number one and try some more things. Does that sound good? Yep. Well, Hopefully, to me. because that's what we're going to do. <laughs> OK, so I'll show my Jupyter lab here. So um, yeah, essentially, which, uh, if, should we, wait, so this is the instructions here. Should we go to the exercise and show as it demo? Um, yeah, you can also just download the download it now. OK, so I'll use the same trick I used before. I will right click here and do copy link and come into Jupyter Lab and do file open from URL and paste it here. And it both downloads it as you see on the side here and it's opened it in Jupyter Lab. Yeah. Should I try running it to show that it works? Yes. <laughs> OK, there we go. OK, and um, now you essentially want to export this into a Python file. Um, the easiest is uh, just going to file, save and export notebook as. So this will download it to my computer? Yep. Mm. And not save file as, save and export. Ah, uh, uh, file. Further down, save and Dave export and as, as executable script. Executable script. OK. But this is downloaded, and where is it now? Yeah. So another, I suppose we also do, we, we try it from the command line here. So I think that what I'm about to show will work for more people. I'll go to file. Or at least it's easier, that, admittedly. New launcher. And from the new launcher, I start the terminal. And I see this is the directory where I'm doing course things. So this may be the first introduction to command line for some people. So for some people, this may seem impossibly hard. And for some people, it will be impossibly easy. That's just sort of how it goes, unfortunately. So if it's too hard, take this lesson as a demo and work slowly and come back to it later now that you're inspired. That's all I can recommend. So I'm copying this uh, line here, and I will paste it. And for me, Control-Shift-V works. I think just Control-V might do something. Uh, control V actually does work. Anyway, so if I run this, then it converts it. So it and says can... it's writing data to weather observations.py. And you can try if it works. If I open the file browser, I see weather observations.py here. And if we come here, we can try running it this way. Python. Oh, and you, it looks like it ran. Yeah, and if you now like, type uh, ls or dir, depending on the operating system, uh, you uh, see that there is a weather PNG being created. Yeah. It wasn't there before. Let's come back to the file browser, and we see weather.png. And Which if I click on this, the same I image it... that was generated before. Ah, uh, the same. Yeah. Okay, so it, it, it was also generated from the from the uh, the notebook, but it was yeah. updated as you can see. It was created seconds ago. Okay, so it actually works.
So, um, oh. let's give our sorry for the videos hiding. Well, I would say let, let's give our viewers okay five minutes to just repeat this again and yeah, see that so we'll, that works on their machine. So we'll give you five minutes. Yeah, this if things go horribly wrong, then um then, well, we're sorry something's gone wrong and sit back and do this as a demo. Okay, thanks. So five minutes, see you shortly. Bye. And there we should be back. And now okay. coming more to um, what the actual yeah. use is of the of so, doing this and putting it in a script yeah so reading through the notes there's some different problems here um and this is sort of i mean this is expected so of course we don't want problems but there's always some places where um like someone's own computer is different or with different operating systems or I have a feeling that there's some cloud service which is not working and doesn't provide shell access. And this is, well, mm, yeah, much, in that case- much we can do um, about that. Um, especially if the, if Jupyter's run on a web service, then this is mostly yeah. out of our control, unfortunately. Yeah. So if it doesn't work, just um, watch. Okay. If it, or if it doesn't work, um, what I would suggest is you download the file, um, copy the data from the file into uh in into a new file that's uh that you call .py, because it mainly is exactly the same. It uh, that Jupyter notebook is mainly Python code and doesn't contain a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue. Yeah. So um, the nice thing uh, with um, was having this as a script is that uh, we now have access to command line arguments. So if you run this from the command line like Richard just did um, when he was in the terminal, we uh, we can add additional informa information in. Um, and the, and that information is accessible inside the code uh, via the sys.argv or via the sys object and um, via sys.argv. And it's interesting to know that the, the first uh, the first value, so argument, this argv stands for argument values. The first argument value is always the program. Or the the no the script name that you're calling, because it's actually the arguments to Python that you're getting there. Yeah. So basically, um, I could run something like Python weather observations. Uh, as an hello. Example. Hello dot png. And the code can figure out that this hello.png is where I should save the figure. Needs to be modified like accordingly, but yes. So from the command line, we have A and B arguments. And from the code, we have it accessible as argv1 and argv2. So should I uh, do yeah. it? Um, yeah. Or... Yes, uh, the the example go uh, also adds the um, the time range because we are looking for something uh, with weather observations that maybe we want to change the, uh, where or what times we actually want to look at. Yeah, but yeah, um, we can also first just change it uh, so that it just uh, changes the output for output name. So I will come. I will open the script itself. So here the icon is a Python script thing. So I double click this and I've opened now weather dot 
py, and I see the script. So it looks a lot like the Python code. In one, in two, where the cells were. So what do yeah. I change? Um, so if yeah. Uh... <laughs> okay, if you if you want to change that, the first input argument is the um, uh, we we will depart from the uh, from the code that's in here a little bit at the moment, um, just so just to make people aware of that. Um, so if we want to have the first ar input argument as the output file name, then we would need to go to um, for, uh, uh, essentially to the end of the script where it says fig okay. .save fig. Let's do what it shows here in the okay. screen share. So, okay, then the first thing we need to do is we need to actually import this sys, um, sys so the system information. Mm -hmm. And that's just to know that, okay, now we can access this system information. It's a package that's um, always available in Python mm -hmm. uh, because it's a basic package. Um, yeah. But we still need that to import it so that we can access the information. And so now, if you're watching, if you're still working on the exercise, stop and just listen to us. So that's so, what I'd recommend. Um, we will change it so that we can uh, set the start and end date um, for uh, with the first and second argument. Arguments are always uh, command line arguments are always separated by spaces. So the first. In that instance, actually, is number one because zero, as we said before, is the script name. Mm -hmm. So that's sysargv1, and the second and the end date would be sysargv2. Okay. And then we want to have the third argument being the output file name. And yeah. um, we can either directly say here um, sys.argv3, or we can create a variable in between. That is that indicates the output file name. Okay, here we go. Okay, and I've saved it. And if you know now, go back to the to terminal. The terminal. So Python weather observations from the first of March, twenty twenty one the end of May. Let's see. Did it work? Let's come back to the file browser. And I see there's an image now called Spring in Tapiola. And it looks different, yeah. for sure. And it's still quite cold and <laughs> cold early March weather. Actually, not that bad though. Actually, there's something odd here. Might be that the data actually doesn't contain the March part because it only starts at okay. uh, yeah, somewhere yeah. beginning of May. Okay. Okay. So, um. So. Yeah. Okay. The, the, so <laughs> now, now, what do we get from this? Well, we get the option to, uh, that we can now essentially modify or call the same code, but use different input or input variables without going back into the code and modifying uh, modifying the script. So you can run this script multiple times with different input parameters. That has the advantage that you can essentially call it from some other tool, or you can call it in another script. Um and can automatically call it with a list of uh of things. Yeah, making okay. it a bit more robust to change to potential changes. Yeah. So now before we go to the exercise, there's a little bit more. So here, what we've done in this code is very basic. So we're just using. The system directly, but there's more advanced modules to do this. So, what can you tell us about that? Well, there are a lot of so-called um, command line argument parses. Um, all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the essentially the more 
complex stuff you want to do, uh, the more very likely complex code you have to write in the end. Um, for simple programs, I think ArcParse is quite efficient because it doesn't need a lot of um, yeah, a, a lot of details, but it's not as flexible. So if you have have some requirements where yeah, you can have requirements that just are not achievable with arc parse. Um, all of these parses uh, commonly uh, give some kind of uh, positional arguments or named arguments. Named arguments help you to, uh, if you have multiple arguments and you have some default values, uh, you don't want to... Um, be, uh, have to make sure that okay position uh position one is always that position two is always that and always have to check okay is it the right thing but you can essentially write okay in the end or you can in the end write um whether observations dot by minus minus um start date and give the start date minus minus end date give the end date minus minus um file output file or output file name or something and the output file name. Um, making the command line argument that your uh, arguments or the command line call that you give a lot more uh, readable and a lot less um, prone to, oh, that was the wrong position. Yeah. yeah. So I believe the next exercise is having you try to modify this weather script to do what we just demonstrated and also use art parse. Yeah. Let's see. Yes. So there's some, well, it's up to you what you work on. So you can keep working on the first part if needed. You can try to do what we just did. You can use art parse if you want and have extra time. Um, then there's another exercise at the very bottom, which we will talk about, but you can try working on it now. Okay. Um, should we go to the exercise now? I think so. And when we come back, we'll quickly discuss a few more details, but... Yes. And so we can't... This is 15 minutes. So... Yeah a relatively oh long amount of time. OK, great. So see you uh, at 45. At 45. OK, bye. Hello, we're back. So let's see. So yeah, so from the notes, it was clear there were lots of different problems in here. And that sort of, that's unfortunate, but I mean, it's, this really is a pretty interesting and difficult thing because this is the first time we're going from pure Python to going and connecting to the bigger operating system you're running on. And there's so many different variations there. There's things like can't access pandas, for example. So that means your Python on the command line is running in a different environment from that on the uh, the the Jupyter I cannot talk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you're having really big problems here, don't give up. So take it and basically go to one of your colleagues who can sit there with your screen and ask, OK, so I'm trying to do this lesson. Can you tell me what's going on here? And you can get some help that way, and it will work, work much better. As long as you sort of understand the general idea of what we've done here, and why these scripts should be used, then you've got the, the main points. So with that being said, what have we learned here in the end? Well, I hope we have learned that um, you can, um, by 
by changing the um, notebook into a into a script or into a pure py into pure Python, um, use command line arguments to modify your or to modify what your program does without modifying the program's code. And yeah, I, I think I would, I would call it program because in in the end, um, this is exactly what uh, kind of distinguishes uh, things. Here, if you, if you have command line arguments, that's something that you kind of always have to call a program with because uh, any any other part that is self-contained, but a program you can call with different arguments. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so if someone comes to us and wants to run these some code with a program on our cluster on many different input files, how would we approach that? Um, that depends a little bit. <laughs> uh, so if if the if the input files have a certain name have a certain naming convention that um or are just numbered, then it's uh, relatively simple because the, you can essentially just go through the numbers and have a have a for loop in a bash script, um, where you with that for loop call the individual, uh, call the individual files or call your script with the individual files as file names. If they are not ordered in a specific way, you probably need to either provide a file that contains um the file names, and you read those in, or you might go into um well either write an additional python script or you, or you provide a uh, or you change your py your script so that it reads in a certain file and if or a certain folder and goes through the folder but if each uh, each of the computations is quite expensive so you can't just do this in one python script or it would take ages but you want to parallelize the computation um you will write likely write some additional script that loops through those files, and then provides them uh, as inputs for the uh, for your for your script at the end, and those inputs are then run individually, and each is one job on the cluster. Yeah. So. It, there, there is, there is no clear yeah. this, this and that because it depends a lot on your situation. But if, uh, but one thing that happens quite regularly is that uh, people have input parameters and, um, and want to want to go through, let's say, a thousand different input parameters uh, that they have pre more or less predefined. Um, if they have them predefined, they can in the script define them once, and then. The uh, calling the input parameter, or so the command line argument, would be the position of that parameter in the list of parameters that they had defi have defined, and each run will take one input per input parameter set, for example. Yeah. Okay. So with that being said, should we go to a break? Until um, I I, I would. Yeah. Give a few more words about uh, okay. additional options like um, using config configuration files, oh. um, because I think it, the 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 problem with command line arguments is that at some point the command line string gets really long, and even if you have um, an argument parser or something, it becomes not really well readable anymore. Mm -hmm. The individual so we... call are running out of time so please continue but let's try to be and quick. i just want to mention that um there are then methods that you can have a look at later on um to write the configurations uh for your for your program into a configuration file and use that as and just be given a configuration file as input argument that is then parsed mm -hmm. that's just what i wanted to mention yeah so like here, for example, we've defined all the parameters for the plot, and yep. it can be generated. OK, yep. great. So let's take a break until two minutes past an hour, and we'll see you back where it ends. Thanks, and bye for now. Goodbye.